I'm Robbie Blackhall Miles. Um, I've just joined the uh, the Council of the Linnaean Society, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this evening's Insect Week event from the Linnaean Society of London. We're a charity and organisation working towards a world where nature is understood, valued, and protected. Fellowship of the Society is open to everybody interested in natural history across all of its disciplines. So if you aren't a fellow, please do think about joining us. As a horticulturalist with a conservation and biodiversity management background, I'm very aware that at least here in the UK, our gardens have the opportunity to play a vital role in wildlife conservation. With this in mind, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nick Chu. Chu Nick Chu is soon to complete his PhD at the University of Bristol in Professor Jane Memmott's Community Ecology Research Group. He studies plant pollinator interactions in urban areas with a particular focus on residential gardens. Previously, he has worked on bumblebee foraging behavior as part of his masters at Imperial College and web building behavior in spiders at the University of Oxford during his undergraduate degree. So over to you, Nick. Thanks, Robbie, for the introduction. Um, and thanks everyone for joining tonight. Thanks very much for inviting me along to such a prestigious event. Um, as Robbie says, I'm a PhD student, sort of coming towards the end now. Um, although I've been saying that for a while, to be fair, at the University of Bristol. And my PhD is looking at insect pollinators, but particularly with an urban focus. And today I'm gonna to talk about the role that gardens can play in pollinator conservation. So just a quick outline, I'll start by touching on what pollinators are, um, a subject I'm sure most of you know on, so I won't dwell on it for too long. I'll then talk about the importance of pollinators, focusing a little bit more on some of the nuance um, and some of the common misconceptions in the media. I'll touch on pollinator decline, and then the main bulk of the talk will look at the garden as a habitat for pollinators, why it's so good, um, and then ways it can be improved, thinking about what you can do as individuals. So what are pollinators? Well, they're animals which move pollen between plants, um, bringing male and female gametes together to enable sexual reproduction. So they're important because plants can't just meet up, so they could easily become genetically isolated. An alternative to relying on animals for pollination is to use wind, um, like many species of grasses and conifers and a whole variety of other plants do. But animals can be much more targeted in the way that they take pollen directly from flower to flower um, and wind pollination is kind of notoriously inefficient as anyone who suffers from hay fever can tell you. So pollinators are incredibly diverse, an estimated 350,000 species, that number will be wildly inaccurate as we discover vast more numbers of insects um, because 99.5% of pollinators are insects. So in some situations we see hummingbirds, particularly in um, Central and, and Southern America. Mammals like bats, for example, can be important pollinators and even lizards can pollinate plants on some oceanic islands. But yet again, insects are really are the little things that run the world. So the main four orders of pollinators are the Lepidoptera, um, moths and butterflies, more than 140,000 estimated species of those pollinate, um, 80 odd thousand beetles in the Coleoptera, then the Hymenoptera, which is bees, wasps, ants and sawflies, another 70 odd thousand species of those, and then Diptera, true flies, um, more than 50,000 of those. So the key point here is it's not all about bees. Um, bees are something like 20,000 species out of 350,000 pollinator species. Um, there's a whole diversity of non-bee pollinators that can be incredibly important as well. So animals are responsible for pollinating nearly 90% of all plant species, and that includes a lot of um, crops that are important to humans. As a result, they're clearly critically important in underpinning terrestrial ecosystems um, and important for our food supply. But at the same time, the importance of pollinators is often quite misunderstood by the media or misinterpreted by the public. Um, for example, the scene from Bee Movie shows that when you take away honeybees from New York City, all the trees and grasses in Central Park seemingly overnight wither and die. 
Um, I mean, clearly, probably I'm sure most people watching tonight would understand that bees are not directly responsible for plant health. So if you take bees away, they're not, not going to instantly wither and die. And indeed, they don't really do anything at all for grasses, which are wind pollinated. Um, but even people who realise bee movie is quite simplistic might still say things like, without bees, there would be no food. Um, and that's a statement that's actually fraught with fact and inaccuracy. Um, the first of which I've already discussed, which is that bees are just one type of pollinator. Um, chocolate, for example, is um, obligately pollinated by a type of biting midge, um, which many of you may not know about. So bees play absolutely no role in the pollination of that plant. In fact, if we actually look at the world's main food crops, we might think pollinators didn't matter at all. Because four of the top five by global production are grass crops, sugarcane, maize, rice, and wheat. And these are wind pollinated, so pollinators play no role in these plants' um, production. And number five, potatoes, that's an underground tuber, so it's not a fruit or a seed, therefore pollinators have no role in it either. <laughs> so overall, pollinators are responsible for about five to eight percent of um, global crop production which is a relatively small fraction, um, albeit still worth some hundreds of billions of dollars per annum. So actually the importance of pollinators for our food supply is much more nuanced than people tend to think And some of the simplistic statements around take away the bees, you take away the food, don't really capture that. Some crops benefit from pollination while others don't. Um, and even those which don't actually benefit um, sorry, even those which do benefit don't actually do so in an all or nothing fashion um, because plants can produce fruits um, asexually, so by self-fertilization, or they can even produce fruit uh, without any fertilization, which is a process known as um, parthenocarpy, which we see in bananas, pineapples and cucumbers, crops that don't rely on pollinators. Nevertheless, 76% of the leading food crops depend to some degree on pollinators. And the key phrase here is to some degree. So for some, they're essential, but for others, their importance varies. So this study, which is um, from 2007, looked at estimating the reliance of different main food crops around the world on pollinators. Um, and they categorized them into plants for which pollinators were essential, of great importance, of modest importance, or of little importance. So they took together a whole load of studies from the literature and looked at experiments which excluded pollinators to see what reduction you would get in the food production. So if you get a reduction of more than 90% when you take the pollinators away, they're viewed as essential. And that was the case for things like kiwi, chocolate, watermelon, uh, and vanilla. They're of great importance, a 40 to 90% reduction if you remove pollinators for apples, blueberries, avocados, and raspberries. Only modest importance for strawberries, um, also great, soybeans and aubergine, and of relatively little importance for things like peppers um, and chilies, tomatoes, oranges, and kidney beans. So there's a lot of variation around these numbers. Um, there's a whole variety of different um, cultivars of these plants, so some will be more dependent on pollinators than others. Um, putting a simple number against it is, is simplistic. But the idea here is that even when a pollinator is important for food production of a certain crop, it's not necessarily an all or nothing relationship. You can get some of that crop without the pollinator, but often the pollinator will increase the quantity, the market value, the nutrition, the flavor, um, a variety of things like that. You may have seen strawberries, um, pictures of strawberries with pollination and without pollination. You do get strawberries without pollination, but often they're quite small and misshapen and wouldn't necessarily be sold in supermarkets. So actually the real importance of pollinators is more for the diversity of our diet and for our micronutrient content rather than actually the overall bulk of our food supply, which is mainly from um, grass crops and things that don't rely on pollinators. And this is particularly important in the developing world. Here, the relationship between people's um, diet and nutritional intake and their health is much more um, closely linked. In the West, we have more access to um, taking vitamin tablets uh, and, and other kind of Western medicine. So things like vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, fluoride, folic acid are particularly um, 
particularly coming from crops that are reliant to a reasonably heavy extent on pollinators. As well as that, pollinators are important for things like medicines, for um, timber, for biofuel, for fibres like cotton, for fodder crops. So pollinators do have a great importance, um, but that, mis that importance I think is often sometimes overblown, um, but particularly kind of the nuances of that are misunderstood sometimes in the media and by the public. So given they do have a great importance for both wild plants and crop plants, it's concerning to see pollinators are in decline. Uh, again, this is something I'm sure most of you are aware of. So declines have already occurred to a very high degree. Um, and often what we're seeing is kind of the tail end of a decline where you haven't already seen the, the, the vast decline that's occurred before we started collecting data. Um, they're also ongoing, continuing today, um, but they vary hugely between different groups of pollinators, different species and different regions around the world. Um, particularly in the developing world, we see, as for many things, a lack of data. So some of the most diverse regions on, on the planet, we don't actually have good data to say what the state is of pollinators, whether they are declining and by how much. Um, here's some data just for Britain, uh, using um, some citizen science monitoring schemes for hoverflies, um, which is the orange line on top, and the blue line um, is for bees on the bottom. And that's showing that declines are continuing since uh, 1980. Um, and as I said before, the declines would have already occurred probably to a much greater degree before then. Um, with declines appearing a bit stronger for hoverflies than bees. Um, this also shows the importance of citizen science data. So they were able to use these national monitoring schemes to come up with occupancy models, which is a measure of whether a species is seen within a particular grid square in the country or whether it isn't. Um, and the kind of the power of citizen science is, is continuing to grow um, as is the robustness of the statistics they're using to analyze the data. Pretty common picture here in terms of the drivers of decline that you'll see for other groups. So a loss of food is a particularly important one, resulting from um, a loss of habitat. Parasites and diseases, um, they will continue to spread. They can jump over from managed honeybees into wild pollinators, um, will be exacerbated by the spread of um, other insects due to climate change. Pesticides used um, potentially in farmland, but also in urban settings. And then climate change with a bit of a question mark here because it's more nuanced in terms of our understanding of its effects. Um, undoubtedly, it will affect pollinators, some potentially in a positive sense uh, and many in a negative sense, um, but we're still yeah, short of having the data yet to really know what effect climate change will have. So all these different drivers actually will interact. So it's not easy to say that there's one particular cause for a decline of pollinators. This schematic here from um, Golson et al's science paper just shows the ways in which some of these drivers can interact. So a lack of food at the top here, limited monotonous floral resources, means bees might be less healthy and therefore their immune response to parasites might be weaker and therefore they might be more strongly affected. So these two things can't necessarily be viewed in isolation. And then going back the same way, the immune response itself is energetically costly, so they need even more food to fight it. So you can get some synergistic effects where two drivers together might have a kind of more than additive effect in a negative sense on pollinator populations. But particularly important is the loss of food because ultimately the presence of food directly underpins pollinator populations. And this has largely occurred due to intensive agriculture. So in the UK, the vast majority of our land, and this is common throughout Western Europe and many parts of the world, is used for agriculture. Traditionally, we would have used relatively low intensity methods, which left space for wildflowers in cow pasture, for poppies in wheat fields, um, larval food plants in the margins, nest sites. But more and more, we're now seeing habitats that look like this. Um, so kind of green deserts devoid of flowers. Um, on the left, this is just a ryegrass pasture from a, um, a beef farm in Gloucestershire that I visited last week for some field work. And if you're a bee, there's not a flower in sight. A wheat field here, um, another kind of desert from a flower perspective with a very you know, poor quality um, grassy field margin and, and relatively close cut hedges. And then perhaps 
most incredibly are our nature reserves. Um, here we have a picture, a lovely picture I took of the Brecon Beacons back in August, looking like a, a glorified golf course. Um, we've taken our nature reserves, these protected areas for nature and for recreation, and we've intensively grazed them with sheep um, and with other, other livestock to leave them as basically ecological deserts, which may come as a surprise to some people listening today, but um, sorry, I should say national parks, not nature reserves, but yeah, the, um, so the Brecon Beacons National Park is like the Lake District, and like many national parks across the UK, is a very kind of short grassy ecological desert from a perspective of the pollinator. So pollinators are, yeah, having a lot of, a very tough time in our rural environments because intensive agriculture has kind of covered our entire country, even in our national parks. So what about urban areas, our towns and cities? Do urban areas have the potential to act maybe as a refuge for pollinators amidst the desolation caused by our beloved Greenbelt? Well, actually, there are some promising results. So on the left, um, we see bumblebee colonies that were placed into sites in farmland, in villages and cities, actually grew faster and larger in the village and city sites than they did in the farmland. On the right, there's a study from Germany. Um, this, the, the graph on the left is from around London. Um, and the study on the right from Germany is showing species richness of bees being higher in urban rather than farmland sites. So there's evidence that urban areas can actually be pretty good for pollinators and potentially better in some situations than some of our farmland. I mean, so how can grayscapes ever really be better than Greenbelt? Because from a satellite image, it, it doesn't look like a good habitat at all. But the answer is because of the role of residential gardens. So these cover about 30% um, of urban areas in the UK. So um, this picture on the right here of Bristol showing in yellow the residential gardens scattered throughout the city. And across the whole of England, it covers 450,000 hectares, 3.5% of the land area. So actually in England, more land is covered by our private gardens than is covered by our remaining semi-natural grasslands or our broadleaf woodland, and about five times as much as our national nature reserves. So they cover a very, very large area. But why are they actually so good for pollinators? Um, so I'm going to talk about five um, different factors here. The quantity of food provided, the diversity of that food supply, um, the timing of food production, the spatial arrangement of gardens within the landscape, and the provision of nesting sites. So in my PhD, I've looked at um, nectar sugar production. So nectar is effectively a sugar solution that pollinators use for energy. Uh, energy is particularly important for flying insects like bumblebees because they use a lot in powering their flight muscles. And the graph on the right here is a bit of a complicated figure to look at, compares the nectar production on the y-axis. You can see that as a measure of energy of these different land uses for nine different habitat types in cities. And you can see that gardens and allotments come out as the best in terms of the nectar production per square meter. In the middle, parks, nature reserves, verges, cemeteries, other green spaces, um, and then kind of down the bottom, pavements and man-made surfaces, as you might imagine. I should also say the axis is, is a, uh, the y-axis is a log axis, so actually the differences between gardens allotments and then the other land uses are much, much higher kind of uh, in reality than they might appear on this graph. So per square meter, gardens and allotments are the best. But allotments only cover about 1% or even less of our towns and cities. Gardens cover more like 30%. So when you scale all that up, you find that within towns and cities, Gardens tend to provide something like 85% of all the nectar sugar. So if you're pollinator foraging in an urban area, you know, almost nine, nine tenths of your food comes from gardens. And within that, I found the, the top five plants providing nectar were ornamental shrubs and climbers. Um, so in this case, fuchsia, pyrus, salvia, honeysuckle, and wallflower. The second point then is around the diversity of food. So rather than just the total mass of sugar provided, what about the 
different plants from which the food comes because nectar and pollen um, from different plants has different chemical composition and that can be very important for ensuring a balanced food supply for pollinators. Also, different flowers have different shapes, different structures, different colours. Um, that means a wide variety of pollinators will be supported by a wide variety of flower types. And in our garden centres, we have literally thousands of different plant species from which to choose. So gardeners are able to create this artificially high level of species richness within their gardens because of the wide variety of native and non-native plants from which we can choose. We're also able to maintain this artificially high level of diversity through a level of disturbance that is intermediate. So this is a kind of classic graph in ecology from uh, Connell in the 1970s. It's actually, it's actually for rainforests, but the same kind of principles apply here for gardens. On the left, you have very, very high level of disturbance. And in a garden setting, we could envisage that is something like this, regularly mowing a lawn and regularly tilling over your borders. That will result in a very low species diversity. On the far right, we have a very, very low level of disturbance. You leave your garden to its own devices and it will end up being covered in bindweed or brambles or ultimately taken over by one or two species, leaving a low level of diversity. But in the middle, we have something intermediate. You're managing that garden, you're providing this intermediate level of disturbance. So in this case, it would be weeding out um, plants, it could be pruning plants back to stop them shading over the rest. And combining that, initially planting a high number of plant species from the garden centre, then also ensuring that that diversity remains by providing this intermediate level of disturbance can help to maintain this kind of artificially high richness that we see in gardens. And the result of this is that gardens have a massively higher plant species richness than natural habitats do. So in 59 Bristol gardens that I measured um, during 2019 in my PhD, I found 636 species in less than one hectare of total land. In reality, that number would have been much higher because I couldn't I identify all the species all the way down to species level, so I grouped some to the genus. Um, so we're talking about many, many hundreds of species in less than one hectare, compared with the nearby National Nature Reserve of 130 species of flowering plant in 126 hectares. So gardens have a species richness which is comparable to some of the most rich habitats on Earth, um, like the tropical rainforest or, or the Finbos in South Africa. The third point then is around the timing of food production. So it's all very well having loads of food at a certain time of year, but you need to ensure you have enough throughout the year. Um, and that's just not the case in farming. So this top graph here shows some work from a PhD student um, who used to be in our lab group a couple of years ago, showing this kind of boom and bust dynamics in farmland around Bristol through the year. In March, there's very, very little food. Um, into May, there's a big um, spring bloom, things like um, wild garlic and uh, hawthorn. And then there's a bit of a gap in June, a little bit more going up in July, gap in August, and then kind of ticking over at a low level in September and October. And the difference between, if we look at the black kind of average line here, the difference between the May boom and some of the, uh, the troughs in supply could be a factor of 10, 20, or even more through the year. Whereas the graph below shows my data for the 59 gardens I measured. And we're seeing, yes, there is a pattern increasing from March into spring, a peak in July, and then starting to decrease into autumn. But actually, it's a variation of about a factor of two through the year, not 10 or 20, as we see in farmland. So gardens have food all year round. Um, they don't have particular gaps um, in the year when there isn't enough food. And that's because gardeners have so many different species from which to choose, many of which are not native. So they have species that flower during all these kind of gap periods that we see in farmland. It could be flowering currant in March, it could be honeysuckle in June, salvia in August, or ivy in late October. And often gardeners will deliberately try to ensure there are not gaps within their garden, so there's flowers all year round. But even if an individual garden has a gap, across a large number of gardens, we tend to see those gaps smoothing out. And this can lead to some interesting effects like winter active bumblebees, 
Um, so bumblebees will sometimes emerge very early in the year um, and feed on flowers that are out in urban areas that wouldn't be out in farmland. And likewise, late in the year, some bumblebee colonies just don't die back as they're meant to, continue to produce workers and carry on through the year, feeding on things like Mahonia or um, Lonicera fragmentissima. So these are all photos I've just taken around Bristol, showing kind of different floral resources that bumblebees are feeding on in the winter months. And if you go for a walk in the countryside um, in February time or in December, you, you won't see a single flower in the farmland. And as soon as you go into a village, you'll see a garden and you'll see bees. So it seems that at these certain times of year, particularly early and late, gardens are where the food is. The third point is around the spatial arrangement, uh, fourth point, sorry, around the spatial arrangement of flowerage habitat, which is radically different between farmland and urban areas. So here we've got a couple of satellite images showing um, an area of arable farmland and a town, and it's taken at exactly the same spatial scale. And if we were to imagine that we are a bee nesting in a small patch of hedgerow in the middle of this arable landscape, or in a garden, let's say, in the middle of this residential landscape, we can think about where the habitat patches are distributed. And in farmland, there will be a few scattered quite widely, and you might have to fly pretty far to find the nearest habitat patch. When you get there, some of them might be quite big, bigger habitat patches than you'd find in an urban area. But in an urban area, there are so many gardens, so many little gardens scattered throughout the landscape that you never have to fly far to find food. And if we then think about the way spatial arrangement of habitat patches interacts with the time of year that those habitats are providing food, you can see that urban areas are you know, better yet again. So we can imagine that if there's a habitat patch providing food in spring, which is the green flower, and I apologize for anyone color colorblind in this schematic, red the summer and autumn in pink. In farmland, there's a good chance that there may not be anything in flower very close to you, or maybe there's only one patch um, close to you. Whereas in an urban area, there will be gardens that flower in spring, there'll be ones that peak in summer, there'll be ones that peak in autumn, and they'll be scattered all around. And this gives you a kind of reliability that you will definitely have access to food when you need it um, in urban areas, which you just don't get in farmland. And you can think about this in terms of the portfolio effect. So this is an idea from economics that if you invest in a large number of stocks and shares in different companies, then on average, you will do much, um, your risk will be much lower than if you invest in just one. So if we imagine in the top picture here in farmland, there's one little patch of woodland which is providing food in spring. It could be wild garlic or bluebells. Let's imagine that patch of woodland gets chopped down, turned into a field. That colony then might die because it hasn't got any spring flowering food. In an urban area, if someone paves their garden over or chops down that one flowering current that was providing a, a spring bloom, well, there's another garden that's flowering in spring very nearby. So your level of risk, just like in investing in you know, a large number of different stocks and shares versus putting all your money in one company, your level of risk is reduced. Um, and that is something where gardens, just because of the way they're arranged in a completely different way than habitat patches and farming, um, have a great advantage. And the final point on why gardens are so good is around nesting sites. So bees use a whole variety of man-made nesting sites in gardens, including things like compost heaps. Um, the tree bumblebee uh, uses bird boxes. There'll be bee hotels, people's walls, uh, sheds, a whole variety of different kind of novel nesting habitats that gardens can provide, which you wouldn't find in rural environments. So what about the cons? What are the main drawbacks for garden habitats? Well, one could be non-natives. So most plants in gardens are not native. Typically, it's about 70% of species. Um, from my data, something like 90% of all the nectar comes from a non-native species in a garden. Are non-natives still attractive and nutritious to a native pollinator? Well, this is from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust website, little section on creating a bumblebee garden. And the picture they've used to advertise it is uh, a non-native globe thistle, Echinops retro, being visited by four native bumblebees, Bombus terrestris. 
Should this surprise us that native pollinators are visiting a non-native plant? And when you look at the data, you actually realize, no, it shouldn't. So Bombus terrestris is found all across Europe, including the UK, Northern Europe, Northern Africa, the Mediterranean, all the way into Turkey, the Near East, and parts of the Middle East. Equinox retro, likewise, doesn't have the same northern distribution, but it's found throughout southern Europe um, and eastern Europe and the Near East. So if you saw a Bombus terrestris visiting a globe thistle in Turkey, you'd say native pollinator, native plant, no surprise. Well, if you introduce that globe thistle into a garden in the UK, effectively you're just renewing an interaction which has occurred in evolutionary history and which is occurring in other parts of that same species range. So there's no intrinsic reason to believe that species should be less attractive or indeed less nutritious to that pollinator. And given the glacial history of Europe and the fact that the species distribution we have currently is, is a bit of a snapshot in time, it's changed constantly throughout glacial and interglacial periods, um, there's no intrinsic reason to believe that there's a distinction between a British plant and a continental plant in terms of whether or not it attracts pollinators. Um, and we don't have endemic pollinators in the UK. So the bees, butterflies, moths that we have in the UK visiting plants will also be found in continental Europe, where they'll be visiting um, different species. It could be a little bit different when you're thinking about plants that come from further afield. So this hummingbird pollinated fuchsia from South America might be less attractive or nutritious to a native pollinator. But yet, when you see them visiting, you will see native pollinators visiting these plants, as in the case of this Bombus terrestris. Um, this is actually an invasive Bombus terrestris in South America visiting a native fuchsia, but it could well be a native Bombus terrestris in England visiting a non-native fuchsia. It wouldn't really make a difference. In this case, it's actually robbing through the top of the plant. So rather than using the corolla tube that's evolved for hummingbird pollination, it's just bypassing the need to pollinate the plant at all and just drinking the nectar straight up the back isn't great for the plant, but it's a kind of ingenious method that a lot of our um, bumblebees will use to access resources that might otherwise be tricky to get at. So it seems that some pollinators, at least in the UK, are able to visit pretty much any resource. And I like to think of urban areas as a bit of a all-you-can-eat buffer. There are some good foods and some bad foods, if you can work out how to choose between them. Some pollinators like this bumblebee here, are gonna like a lot of different dishes. Others might not like many at all. They may only like one or two. Um, and there may even be a small minority that couldn't find anything to eat at all. So undoubtedly we'll see a different community of pollinating insects in urban areas compared with, let's say calcareous grass, which again would be different to farmland, which is already a completely unnatural environment, or heathland or woodland. There might be a slight bias towards the generalist pollinators, the ones that are able to visit a vast number of different non-native plants. But actually there might be many, many specialists that are able to visit plants because of introductions. So some good examples include things like the loose strife bee, which um, is a specialist on common loose strife in the UK. But the introduction of non-native dotted loose strife has given it a new food resource, um, similar with some Campanula specialists, because there's a wide variety of European campanulas, right, the Serbian bell flower that you'll see um, throughout urban areas. So urban pollinator communities we expect are different, but that doesn't necessarily make them any less valuable. Second possible con, drawback of the garden habitat is what my supervisor like to call horticultural bling. So this is the idea that ornamental plants, whether or not they're native, have often been modified into all sorts of fluffy and weird horticultural forms. Um, so this might result in there being less food, like in the case of a multi-petal rose, where the, uh, the nectar and pollen has been converted into petals. Um, or there might be nectar in there, as in the case of fluffy carnations. It's just very hard to access um, because it's just impossible to get through the wide you know, kind of tangle of, uh, of petals up the top. But then other varieties, again, might have been modified to have bigger flowers and therefore might even have more resources in them. And this is all kind of what I've found through my nectar measurements. <laughs> so there's a lot of variation. Some of these will be duds. Some of these might be fantastic. But again, urban areas have this incredible diversity of flowering plants. So that, sure, there might be a few duds in there, which multi-petal dahlias, multi-petal roses, not providing all, very much at all. 
but they're not going to ruin it because there are so many other plants providing food. And actually, often you find when you start to do the do the maths and you visit gardens and you calculate the nectar supply, the biggest sources of food are not even ornamental flowers. They're often plants that people don't even realize flower or, or don't pick because of the flowers. Things like pyrus or um, Japanese maples, a laurel hedge, a privet hedge. A lot of these plants are picked because of their foliage or their structure. But actually, if you look very closely, some of these really tiny non-modified flowers can be jam-packed with pollinators. So that kind of, I guess, buffers urban areas against the risk of, cult of over modifying flowers, the fact that people are not even interested in some of the flowers that are providing the most food. And then the third point is pesticides. So pesticides are always a contentious topic. Undoubtedly, they can harm pollinators. Um, but for me, whether or not there is food present is always the major driver of the pollinator population. Um, so a large amount of food that is tainted with pesticides can host pollinator populations, whereas no food at all cannot. In urban areas, there's certainly an issue with gardeners using pesticides directly, but there's also a study recently which found that if you go to the garden centre and buy plants, the vast majority of them are already dripping with pesticides, even if you don't then treat them with pesticides when you get them back to your garden. Um, so because I'm quoting from this paper, our ornamental plants are widely treated with a mixture of insecticides and fungicides, Significant residues of these chemicals are still present when they reach retailers and gardens. Concentrations overlap with and sometimes considerably exceed those known to do measurable harm to bees. And the safest option is to buy plants from an organic nursery, grow plants from seed, or plant swap with those you know aren't using pesticides. So what can you do to kind of maximize the value of your garden to pollinators? Because I found there was huge variation between gardens. When I visited 59 gardens, and measured the nectar supply, I found that there was a range from two grams of nectar per year to about two kilograms. That's a factor of about a thousand. So there's a huge amount of diversity out there, implying some gardens have been managed very well for pollinators and some very, very poorly. But interestingly enough, I found no correlation at all with the size of a garden. So within my relatively suburban gardens in Bristol, which varied between 30 square meters and 450 square meters. There was no correlation between the amount of food they provided and their size. And that was because often in a garden, it was a single shrub in the corner or a flowering hedge or one potted plant that was providing the majority of food. And if you look at the garden pictured here, it could just be that little ceanothus in the back right or the choisier in the back left, which is providing together, let's say, 90% of the food. And that those two plants could be in a very small garden, they could be in a very large garden. And this is quite a positive message because I guess it means you, everyone has an opportunity to benefit pollinators, even if you have a very small space. So even if you just have a little window box or a small paved front garden where you can only have a potted plant, you don't need a large space in order to provide food for pollinators. So firstly, maximize flowers per unit space. And shrubs are a fantastic way to do this. So in my data, I found something like 60% of all the nectar came from shrubs in gardens. And that's because they have this three-dimensional arrangement of flowers. So in quite a small space, you can pack in way more flowers than you would if you just did a standard bed. Secondly, plant for year-round color. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, it's important that pollinators have food all year round. It's also look good in your garden to have year round flowers. So some early species to focus on here would be things like willows, crocus or pyrus, providing nectar in February, March, April. And then later species, things like sedum or ivy or, or mahonium to kind of keep the pollinators going towards the end of the year. And just as a little aside here, I found that the vast majority of nectar provided late in the year, so August, September, October, was coming from tubular flowers. So things like fuchsia and salvia and cosmia and penstemon um, were providing 70 to 80 percent of all the nectar. And what this means is if you're a bumblebee or potentially a moth or a butterfly with a long tongue, you've got a lot of food. But if you're a solitary bee with small mouth parts or a fly, hoverfly, some other pollinators, you potentially have none of that food accessible to you. So one sort of slightly more nuanced point here would be try and prioritize planting flowers that have quite an open 
accessible structure later in the year to make sure that things like solitary bees, which have quite small mouth parts, have access to food. Uh, and that's where these three are good examples. Sedum, ivy and mahonia are relatively open and accessible to all pollinators. Mowing less often. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about this and about no mow may and, and that kind of thing. It doesn't mean having a long wildflower meadow that you can't use for recreation necessarily. Um, this was a front garden I visited for fieldwork um, recently, which was only marginally longer than a standard lawn would be, but absolutely chock a block with birds with trefoil and daisies and, and red clover. And clearly there's a whole load of factors involved here in terms of the soil type and uh, whether the lawn's been fertilized or herbicides, all sorts of things. It's not just the mowing frequency. But just mowing your lawn that little bit less often and you can still use your lawn for your recreation can make a massive difference in terms of allowing things to flower. But clearly, if you can leave a patch aside for a wildflower meadow, that would be fantastic as well. Pesticides, we've already talked about this. Um, avoiding pesticides as much as possible, or at the very least kind of cutting down, is a good thing to do. And that's especially important if a plant is in flower. So um, if you're going to spray a plant with pesticide, do it when it's not flowering, because that's when a pollinator would be visiting it. And of course, buying from organic garden centers if you can. And finally, creating habitat diversity. So most of this talk has been focused on food supply for pollinators, talking about nectar and, and to a lesser extent pollen. But actually pollinators have a whole load of other needs, and that includes nest sites, shelter, food plants for larvae like caterpillars, um, habitats for larvae in ponds. For example, hoverfly larvae often live in ponds or in rotting wood. So there's a whole variety of things pollinators need as well as flowers, and having a garden that has habitat diversity can encourage that. So here we've got a vegetable patch with some bare soil that maybe solitary bees could use to nest in, um, a tree that perhaps tree bumblebees could use uh, or it could provide shelter. There's a flower rich border, there's a pond, there's a shrub, there's a lawn which in this example could be quite a lot flowerier than it is. Um, a log pile in the corner, there's a whole variety of different things you can use but having this diversity of habitat type, microhabitat if you like, within a small space can really help pollinators for all their different needs as well as just um, flowers. So on that note I just I want to wrap up and thank my supervisors, Jane at University of Bristol, Kath at Northumbria, Ian in Cardiff and Steph at the RHS. My field assistant, Joe, who's in the photo on the right here, helps me painstakingly go through and measure nectar in more than 200 plant species. All the Bristol homeowners who gave me access to their gardens, um, the Botanic Gardens of Bristol, where I spent a lot of time doing some of this work. Uh, and my funding is through NERC, Natural Environment Research Council, and the RHS. So very happy to take questions now, um, but also feel free to email me or, or send a message to my Twitter if you want. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. That was absolutely fascinating. And there were certainly some points in there that I'm going to be taking away with me. Um, I thought that the comparisons between farmland and gardens were uh, fascinating. Um, Thanks, Robbie. <clears throat> and... Um, so we've had one question already, um, which is from Alex, and he asks, aren't pollinators necessary for the reproduction of potatoes? And I think that that links to your, um, your chart showing the four different uh, wind pollinated species and, and potatoes, the important crops. Um, yeah, I am. Um... I admit when I put that in, I kind of, I, I thought I'd lost over it a little bit too quickly. So the, the production of, yeah, the production of the potato itself, obviously not being a fruit, isn't linked directly to pollinators, but the seeds are linked. Um, my understanding, I'm getting onto shaky ground in terms of how much I know here, is that generally commercial potato growing is, is not, well, we don't, we don't tend to reproduce them by seeds. They're generally, you will buy a potato, put it in the ground, and it will grow from a potato. But if you are breeding together different varieties, perhaps, or yeah, if you're looking to get potatoes from seeds originally, then I think pollinators can be necessary for that process. So it's a little bit simplistic to say potatoes don't benefit from pollination, other than kind of directly the kind of tuber itself. But again, I guess it's getting at the complexity that there are things that absolutely need pollinators. There are things that absolutely don't. 
and then there's some things in the middle where they can benefit from it and they can not. But yeah, it's an important point to make. I was a little bit, uh, I glossed over that one a little bit too quickly. Thank you. Uh, Alison Harper asks, how do you weigh nectar? <laughs> so it's, I was going to include some pictures of the, um, the work itself that sort of ran out of slides. So you take a tiny little micro capillary tube, which is a really small glass tube, and you stick it into the flower and that by capillary action just sort of sucks up the nectar. You can think of it like a little sort of version of a bee's tongue. From that, you can then measure the amount that's gone through the tube to give you the volume of the solution. Then you use this thing called a refractometer, which is something you hold up to your eye, like a little kaleidoscope. They use it in kind of um, beer brewing and jam making. And that will tell you the amount of sugar as a concentration um, of the solution based on the amount that light refract refracts through it. And then you can do a bit of maths to basically work out the mass of sugar based on the volume of solution and the concentration of solution. And the numbers are incredibly low. Um, we're talking about micrograms here, which is a millionth of a gram. And even the big sources like Fuchsia, that's around about 8,000 micrograms, I think. So eight, eight milligrams, eight thousandth of a gram. But when you're thinking about plants that have potentially hundreds or thousands of flowers on them, then it does start to add up. And of course, a bee is much, much smaller than a person. So kind of thinking it in terms of a person's amount of sugar, it, it isn't comparable. Great. But it's um, fiddly, is the, uh, yeah, <laughs> is the take home. So Ellen uh, Kenchington asks, is there a positive feedback to the rural areas from the urban? Do the pollinators spread out from the urban centres to pollinate mm. crops? That's a really good question. And it's something I'm really interested in when I actually get some time to do it, kind of working on a little bit more explicitly. But the answer is in the, in the UK, our urban areas are mostly very small villages and towns scattered throughout the countryside. And that will contrast with, you know, the kind of um, Midwest of America or whatever. But we have all these tiny little towns and villages scattered. And I kind of know this when I was trying to find field sites for some fieldwork this year that weren't close to towns or cities or any little villages. It was actually quite hard. And pollinators, some of them can fly quite far, potentially, you know, a kilometre if you're a bumblebee, potentially more if you're a honeybee or even a few hundred metres for a solitary bee. And the answer is a lot of farmland is within reach of an urban area. And there's different ways of looking at that. If pollinators are nesting in gardens, they could potentially fly out and visit farmland and potentially visit the crops. But even pollinators visit, living in farmland um, could actually be using gardens as a kind of um, lifeline at those times of year when gardens are providing the food. So maybe in farmland in the summer, there's loads of you know flowery hedges, it's all good, and a pollinator doesn't need to go into the nearest town, but maybe early in the year or late in the year, it uses that as a lifeline to keep it alive. And these are some really interesting kind of questions that I think, yeah, I think probably are the case, but still needs a lot more work. And no doubt you'll be doing some of that work. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rex Walters asks, would you please comment on the value of vegetable gardens? Which species in a vegetable garden are best? Yeah, so definitely vegetable gardens and, and allotments are fantastic. And some work from our group in the past, a paper led by Kath Bulldog, one of my supervisors in 2019, found that the species richness of bees was highest in um, allotments even higher than gardens, um, similar but even higher. And that's could be a result of there's a lot of bare soil for ground nesting solitary bees, but there's also a, yeah, a lot of variety of, of different kind of flowering plants. And allotments, you know, I've got my I've got allotment in Bristol myself. And the sort of the heterogeneity, the microhabitats you get from allotments, because you've got all these little grids, these little patches. Some are managed, you know, incredibly strongly, some are derelict and overgrown, some are somewhere in the middle. So that gives you that habitat diversity, which will benefit um, species diversity. In terms of the best plants, I mean, I guess there's, yeah, there's a whole variety of things. Obviously, people will often grow herbs. Um, herbs are kind of fantastic for pollinators, something like oregano or thyme or mint. You'll see everything from bumblebees to butterflies to beetles visiting those. Lavender is very good as well. Um, some bumblebee friendly plants like borage or um, beans, very commonly grown, but particularly I would say herbs and, and letting things flower when you can. 
obviously letting it onions or leeks bolt is probably not um that you know, kind of that that high up on the allotment holders agenda but when they do you really notice quite how good these plants are all notice so letting things flower when you can is fantastic i've seen purple sprouting broccoli that's been left to go over absolutely covered in pollinators in the yeah. past um, and there's no harm in letting your purple sprouting broccoli go over because you can eat the flowers on that too. Um, Sarah L says, how much of a fuchsia's nectar is available to UK native pollinators? Is there a select group of pollinators that nectar rob? The fuchsia is quite an interesting one. If you did the measurements on the depth of the corolla tube, sort of the the tubular part of the flower, you might say it rules out a lot of pollinators in the UK, but the reality is actually they, they tend to just crawl up inside the flower. So a lot of pollinators will be able to kind of stick at least half their body up inside it. So they can actually, you see social wasps, for example, vascular, um, you know, your kind of, your picnic wasps, actually just crawl all the way inside Crocosmia or, um, or Fuchsia, even though their mouth parts are tiny little kind of chewing things, not, not a long term. So they can get at the nectar, it appears, um, despite having very small mouthparts, just because they crawl all the way inside. Them. Personally, I've seen I see wasps, I see the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, and I see Bombus pascorum, the common carter bee, visiting fuchsia regularly, um, and honeybees. Haven't seen anything else. Um, certainly haven't seen any hoverflies. Um, moths probably do, but I yeah, you'd have to come out at night. In terms of nectar robbing, fuchsia is actually, I haven't personally seen it being nectar robbed that much, but I know Bombus terrestris will rob it, but I think they can actually just access it legitimately by kind of shoving their head in. Um, but you will see Bombus terrestris robbing, well, most things, uh, to be honest, the, the red flowering salvias, aquilegia, and seemingly sometimes it could have got in legitimately, it was just being lazy. So for me, Bombus terrestris is the one that seems to rob the most, but the um, honeybees do it as well. So it's mostly, yeah, it's mostly the kind of the social bees that will do that robbing behaviour. I've seen Bombus terrestris robbing from some of our native long tube flowers as well. So um, <laughs> Just laziness sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, just looking at, the, at the, the questions, we've still got a little bit of time to go with the questions. So if you've got any, any more questions, please do put them in the question and answers box rather than the chat. Um, We've got a uh, question from Julia Massey-Stewart. And Julia says, great talk, fascinating research. Thanks so much. Do you, Nick, have a go-to list, uh, apart from the plants that you mentioned, as the best time of year diversity, structure diversity for different pollinators? So, um, so yeah, a list of... Uh, maybe a website or a book or something that that gives the best kind of range of structural diversity that you can mm. yeah well, but, yeah firstly thanks thanks for the compliment on the talk um the short answer is no because every time you try and come up with a list you then just sort of change your mind very regularly so there are, there are loads of great resources out there like um the rhs lists um but yeah, admittedly, they, they can be very, very long because ultimately there are a large number of species that can be good for pollinators. Um, there's the logos for plants for pollinators. There's um, there's just observing things when you go to the garden centre, frankly. But I think part of the problem is there is so much we don't understand. And there's also so much variation in terms of location, plant variety, weather conditions that you can, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will agree with me here. You can walk past a budlia one day um, maybe a large patch of it on the train line and see nothing on it at all and suddenly think, oh, maybe Buddy isn't as good as it's cracked up to be. And then you walk past another one and it's completely covered. And is that a different variety? Is it just sunnier day? Is it just a different location where there's more pollinators around? And there is still so much we don't know that I think it is quite hard to fully, to have a kind of definitive list on which plants are best for which pollinators. So I would say, yeah, I mean, keep your eyes peeled and kind of, and, and see what's working. Uh, there are all sorts of great resources out there, but yeah, I mean, the short answer is I don't personally have a list because every time I try and make some sort of arbitrary top 10 list, I change my mind, so. <laughs> but, you know, diversity is always the best. Kind of a lot of different flowers that will suit different pollinators um, is always the best in the absence of complete 
kind of complete knowledge, which we still don't by any means have. Brilliant. Um, Alison Harper asks, uh, can seeds treated with fungicide affect pollinators negatively? Um, what was the final word, sorry? Oh, negatively, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think the short answer is yes. I'm not, per yeah, I'm not personally an expert on fungicide. I remember definitely that graphic I was showing from um, Dave Goulston earlier. Might just, uh, he's far more of an expert than I am. Go back to that one and do a bit of cheating. Uh, where are we? Yeah, so here in this graphic, he talks about fungicide increasing the toxicity of some of the other compounds, so pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. So, yeah, as I say, I'm not an expert on this, but it appears that there is evidence that fungicides will kind of modify the effects of other compounds rather than maybe being directly toxic themselves. Um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of all I can say on that one. I think it was definitely, definitely something I would need to read up more on. I think that um, from my understanding um, from uh, of, of fungicides uh, in horticulture is that um, for, for seeds, you know, the, the impact of the fungicide by the time the, the plant is flowering is actually quite minimal, although there may be mm -hmm. residues in the soil. Um, so um, uh, as you say, Nick, um, it, it's probably a more, in-depth piece of research to be able to answer that question properly yeah and i should say this this graphic i think is largely applying to things done on a mass scale for agriculture rather than um in gardens um so it might be a different kind of treatment method in that respect um so we've got a few more questions coming in actually um paul miskin asks um Regarding the 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 um, sorry, regarding eco survival value, what about the other useful elements of pollinators like soil creation and consequent carbon fixing? Yeah, I didn't. I definitely didn't talk about all the kind of ecosystem service or processes that pollinators are providing. Clearly. Pollinators, if you view them in some of the other functions they, they carry out, they, they're, yeah, they're, they're components of food chains, they feed um, birds, they um, will have carbs. So what were what the ones mentioned? Carbon fixing. And Yeah, carbon fixing was one of the points. I mean, I guess carbon, carbon fixing in the fact that they will help promote um, plant reproduction in that sort of indirect sense. Um, I'm not sure about any kind of direct carbon fixing but essentially um but i think yeah pollinators certainly have a wide variety of um different beneficial roles i think today i was focusing mostly on the ones that they that distinguish them from non-pollinating insects um so the difference between a fly that doesn't pollinate and a fly that does pollinate for example um rather than just the fact that being insects they are important components of, of the ecosystem um, but certainly I didn't give by any means a kind of in-depth, a completely in-depth picture of the benefits pollinators provide. Okay. And Alex asks, are there many non-native garden plants or flowers which are toxic for our pollinators? E.g. rhododendron lutea produces grey anatoxin, which is toxic for honeybees and us, but not for bumblebees. Okay. Um, not something I'm an expert on. I mean, I know that there's evidence that, well, even some native plants like um, tilia, lime trees, provide, uh, could, can produce toxins. Uh, nicotiana, I know, produces, well, produces nicotine, and there's some evidence that that can, beyond a certain threshold, become toxic for pollinators. Um, it's quite a powerful paper, insecticide, in fact. Hmm, there's a paper which talks about a possible adaptive role of nicotine in the nectar of um, tobacco plants being it kind of stops pollinators drinking too much nectar, basically. It's sort of, you can have this much and then beyond a certain threshold, it starts to kick in as a toxin. But equally, it may just be a kind of, yeah, I don't know whether it's it's possible for a tobacco plant not to have nicotine in its nectar. It may just be incidental. Um, 
so yeah not something i'm personally an expert on but i think there definitely will be a lot of plants where native or non-native potentially where um there are toxins beyond a certain uh threshold um this is something where obviously um i know beekeepers will be the the real experts on they pay attention to this stuff uh yeah very very highly in terms of what's killing their bees and making poor quality honey and all that kind of stuff I read an interesting paper recently that looked at um, bees learning behavior when it comes to um, toxic uh, nectar and pollen. Mm. Um, and the, and the, in the case of uh, rhododendrons, um, certain bee species very quickly adapt to, um, to the gray anatoxins. So that, so that was, uh, that I found that absolutely fascinating. Mm. Um, just having a look at the questions. Um, one here from I'm not quite sure who they are because their name isn't in the in the Q and A box. Um, interesting that you highlighted potential role of shrubs and hedges. They've attended a few talks recently, and other speakers haven't really done that. Any suggestions as to what the potential nectar for a th for a uh, say three or six foot hedge or a couple of shrubs might be um, this might be very good for uh, option for houses of say multiple occupancy where landlords um, have a, put on a pressure for low maintenance in the garden yeah I mean it, it really when you, when you start to actually do the maths and you get your values back. I mean, my methods were just to walk around a garden, count every single flower, and then combine those flower values with nectar values to tell me what was producing the nectar. And when you get the data back, you find that very often it'll be one shrub in the corner of a what looks like quite a nice flowerish garden, and just that one shrub is 90% of the nectar. And surprise, surprise, that's where all the pollinators are as well. Um, it could be, yeah, it could be a privet hedge that's just from one garden to the next. Someone cut it a little bit earlier, someone didn't cut it. And it makes all the difference so the nectar values can be yeah enormous for the right plant with the right number of flowers so if something is allowed to flower and obviously some hedges are kind of better at this than others privet seems to be quite um sensitive to, to being pruned then it will produce a vast amount of nectar so i mean i know a, i know a, a flowering current bush of about about 5,000 flowers will produce about four grams of nectar, I think it is. And when you start to work out how that compares with a carpet of snowdrops or something, you realize, or a primroses, you realize you wouldn't, you wouldn't have space in your entire garden if the whole thing was carpeted in primroses to get the amount of nectar that one shrub provided. Um, so yeah, it's hard to kind of come up with absolute values uh, off the top of my head, but the answer is shrubs and hedges very much could provide that. And I know from my field work, in urban areas at the moment. I'm walking around uh, looking for where bees are and catching them. And I spend a lot of time in supermarket car parks um, <laughs> and around the front of car dealerships because there'll just be one flowering cotoneaster or an escalonia or something like that that is absolutely buzzing. And vast areas kind of uh, have absolutely nothing in, even if they look reasonably flower rich. And it just comes down to the right species with high nectar value and in the case of Catonia Asta, they seem to be an absolute magnet um, and being allowed to flower and not being pruned too heavily. So in terms of low maintenance um, councils, uh, blocks of flats and all that kind of stuff, absolutely shrubs, perennial shrubs, which will flower for year after year are a phenomenal way of, way of doing it. I, I see um, bedding kind of shrub bedding schemes outside in, in urban areas. Um, and it's absolutely amazing when they're just left to do their thing. But mm. when when they're chopped all to a very specific level, which is about knee height, and every single flower is chopped off them in the middle of the in the middle of the flowering season, um, I just kind of shrivel up and die inside <laughs> to see that happening. Um, so we're probably coming to the end of the questions, but there are. Just a couple of couple more to ask. Um, yeah, happy with that. And um, one is from someone that hasn't given their name. Do you think the refutation uh, of we can survive 
uh, reef food without pollinators pollinators should be qualified by all the other keystone roles of insects to underline the value that humans and insects are codependent for survival. Yeah, I mean, I, I deliberately came at the importance of pollinators with a slightly more nuanced view, just because I think pretty much everyone tuning into this talk today probably knew bees and pollinators are incredibly important. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what they're important for and what they're not important for. Um, and certainly you need to think about who you're talking to and what messages you're you're conveying. I'm definitely not trying to say in this talk, pollinators aren't that important. They are incredibly important, but I, at the same time, I mean, as a scientist, I don't like it when people get there. Kind of people people say, send the right message, but through incorrect facts, because that can be you know very much um, undermined. Pollinators, just in terms of the pollination service they provide, are already incredibly important. Um, and undoubtedly all the other insects in terms of you know, all the different um, processes they provide are incredibly important as well. So if I was giving this talk to perhaps a less learned audience, I might um, be a little bit more cautious in terms of um, talking about what pollinators are not important for. I just think it's films like Bee Movie, which kind of give the impression that as soon as you take bees away, all the trees and grasses wither and die. I find quite frustrating because Pollinators are so important, it's quite easy to get the message right. Um, and it's frustrating when they when they get it wrong, even if they are kind of saying the thing you want them to say. Um, so yeah, as a scientist, I'm always very much interested in getting things factually right, but that doesn't stop the fact that pollinators are incredibly important and it would be very, very sad and very harmful in terms of yeah, our food supply and our nutrition and our health if pollinators were to you know, continue to decline in the way they are. And if we, for many crops, we rely very, very heavily on honeybees and with the spread of varroa mites and all the different diseases that are happening around the world right now and colony collapse disorder and all that kind of stuff. A bit like the portfolio effect and the risk management I talked about earlier, relying very, very heavily on one thing um, is very risky. So I'm certainly advocating protecting wild pollinators so we have our, uh, we've hedged our bets across a wide variety of species. Um... Alex asks, why are Ketoniasters so attractive to pollinators? I don't know. I've measured the nectar and it's, it's substantial but not record-breaking by any means. But I'm doing fieldwork at the moment and I, my first fieldwork site was um, walking around Bristol. It started raining, which the forecast said it wasn't going to. And I thought, right, I need to find a plant that I know there'll be bees on even in the rain. And it's Ketoniaster. It's the kind of plant where they love it so much that even when it starts raining quite heavily, you'll find bumblebees on it. Um, and I don't fully know. <laughs> it's a question I ask myself quite a lot. Uh, it seems to be the red flowering variety more than the white, well, the kind of the tiny little red flowers rather than the more slightly larger white ones. But there's hundreds of different species out there. And yeah, I don't know. It must be something to do with the quality of the food it's providing. I've only measured the amount of sugar in the nectar. I haven't looked at all the other different um, quality components of nectar because nectar is not just sugar and water it has you know trace elements of amino acids it's got different kind of floral volatiles and scents so something like ketoniasis it's either incredibly attractive or incredibly nutritious or both and i'll i'll try and find out but <laughs> i work with i work with uh, the conservation of britain's only native species of ketoniaster and um it has the most pathetic looking flowers yeah um <clears throat> I think I've ever seen and yet it is always absolutely smothered in in pollinators mm. um, which I always find fascinating because the flowers are hidden underneath the leaves and you know they really look they've hardly got any petals they look really quite drab. Yeah one, one thing I found really interesting walking around gardens doing the nectar maths was basically the flowers providing a lot of nectar are not even necessarily the big cherry ones they can be you know some flowers have loads of nectar for example but um, Japanese maple, you would, people probably didn't even know they did have flowers, or um, yeah, Ketoniaster with those tiny, tiny little flowers that look like buds that never open, um, actually provide a huge amount of food, even though they're tiny, not very showy things, and that's where it gets really, yeah, really kind of interesting and a little bit unexpected sometimes. And I think a great uh, question to finish our question and answer session on is um, from Julia Massey-Stewart, who thanks you for your first answer to an earlier question um, and asks, can we read your research anywhere? 
Ah, yes, that's definitely sort of implying I should have put that in really, that question. Um, <laughs> so my first paper, which is um, where I talk about the amount of nectar gardens produced relative to other urban habitats, is published in the Journal of Ecology, uh, free to read, open access for everyone. There's also some media articles on it. Um, there are a couple of, there's one in the Telegraph, there's one in the Conversation that we wrote, which is an online article. So there's a few, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether there's some ability for me to share this in the chat or something that might be possible, but yeah, that's published. And the other one, which is talking about the specifics of which plants are producing the most nectar is in review. Uh, I'm refreshing it nervously because it's awaiting a decision at the moment, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully soon that will be published. So yes, there are some links out there. And if people are hanging around, I can probably just pop that in the, uh, in the chat. That's, Unless there's another way of um, linking that to the talk afterwards on the recording or something, I don't know. Does your research group have a website or a web page that people could be? Do, but to? it's not. <laughs> it's not very often uh, updated, oh, so okay. that's probably not the best approach. But um, okay. if I just stop sharing now, I will just find. I'll find a couple of links and stick them in the chat quickly, if that's all right. That's fine, um, Nick, you can email them to me later on as well, and I can attach them to our YouTube recording. Yes, that would sound probably the best approach. So, <laughs> so Nick, I found that talk absolutely fascinating. And from the chat, so many of our uh, other 78 attendees uh, from actually all over the world today found it fascinating too. Um, I think for Thanks me, <laughs> I think that for me, the comparisons between farmland and, and uh, urban landscape and also the comparisons um, between um, between our urban landscape and our um, uh, national parks and and national nature reserves were were amazing to see. Um, I think some research by the, the Wildlife Trusts found that we have more space for pollinators in all of our gardens put together in the UK than we do in all of our national nature reserves, which I think is an absolutely amazing mm. statistic and should encourage everybody to garden with pollinators and other wildlife in mind. Um, so, Nick, I wanted to thank you from myself, from our attendees tonight, and from the Linnaean Society for this evening's talk for our Insect Week. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks for seeing so many people come and lots of really interesting questions as well.